all you've got is your story and all you've got your content and you've got to make that work. On LinkedIn, you're able to pick and choose the right medium to tell your story the best. Uh, almost half of uh, social traffic that goes to B2B sites come from LinkedIn. So this thing is a beast. Don't neglect your social media channels. If you have a blog that's like 1,700 words, on average, that's about seven minutes and 30 seconds to read. And on LinkedIn, the average time to, to spend on that platform is only seven minutes and 38 seconds, right? Of course, they're not gonna engage a lot. The first lesson for everybody is... Any B2B brand that is not prioritizing LinkedIn as a channel is gonna struggle. We now get so much more from LinkedIn as a channel than we ever got from email. My bet is that it's gonna be the same for the next 30 years because everybody wants to be the next TikTok. No one wants to be the next LinkedIn. So Anthony, welcome to Marketing in the Madness. I'm super excited to have you here today. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, and do you know why? Because your experience is incredible. You've worked with some major brands and now, just like my agency does, you focus on B2B. So I'm super excited to learn from you. And as I always do, I'm sorry, listeners, I feel like you're always hearing the same from me on this, but I want to learn a bit more about Anthony first. So tell me about you and your career and what you're doing today. Whoa, I mean, how far back do we want to go? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, start with the relevant stuff. Well, for start, let's start with the irrelevant stuff. Okay. Uh, I have a degree in print. I spent four years learning print in university, which I'm doing nothing with right now. <laughs> but, but do you know what? That is a huge part of our, yeah, I mean, I don't know how old you are, and I'm not going to be rude enough to ask Anthony, but a big part of my career when I started in the world of advertising, print obviously was, you know, what we were doing. I was working at magazines and then I moved to working at more graphic design agencies and the kind of tactile, beautiful, you know, GF Smith papers, anyone who's worked in marketing for a long time will probably know them, that, you know, it was, it's that print and the quality of print was a huge part of what we do. And I still love the, the realness yeah. of print. So it's probably given you some pretty good grounding. I think what, what it's given me is the appreciation of the moment, of content, right? Because ultimately, um, it's digital now, because it's so, it feels so uh, easily available that we pass by all the time, right? The amount of times we pass by a post on social media that probably got someone spent like two days writing and then six days, you know, shooting. And we just go, eh, next, <laughs> right? Versus in packet of the day and print, at the very least, we flip the page and we go, oh, that was pretty cool, right? So I think that I did have that, the moments are still there, but I feel like um, in print back in the day, you know, you had more of that, that, that moment was more lingering. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but that's what I started out in print. Um, and then I moved to the UK and uh, I saw all these jobs for uh, SEO copywriting. I'm like, I'm not sure what that is. I'm going to give it a shot. So I ended up with a uh, SEO copywriting job and then uh, went to social media when I got into uh, charity sector. Uh, worked for Bernardo's, worked for uh, Save the Children, which was very rewarding. Um, and then I moved in uh, to uh, first to Rackspace, which is like, you know, the B2B side of things. Um, then I got into Just Eat, which was just a dream. Um, and then Pret and then just B2C stuff. So, uh, yeah, I, I fell in love with social media and this, uh, the charity side. Um, just, you know, what an incredible medium to connect with your supporters and let them feel the the power and the effects of your work, I mean, sign me up, right? So um, we can do the same in brands. Yeah. We can do the same B2B brands. Yeah, I know. Right? I mean, that is that is super important because I think B2B forget about, well, the stuff that you were talking about right at the beginning there, those moments, those, um, you know, the real life, the real human beautiful things that you can do as a brand to a human it doesn't matter if you're b2b you're still human to human and i talk about that a lot um but I, I, that's definitely something i'd like to explore with you so wow you've had a pretty epic career from rackspace running seo no it wasn't uh 
Uh, SEO was in uh, uh, Rackspace. Rackspace, I was already doing social media there. Okay. So, yeah. so you you went from print to SEO to social media. I mean, that's quite, I mean, obviously all marketing, but that's quite some changes. What did you, yeah, what did you learn along that journey? Like what what are the kind of you know, transferable skills that you took from each role as well? I'll tell you what, um, again, it's about content. I feel like, oh, how, 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 how deep should I get into this? But I do feel like a lot of times in marketing, when we're given a budget, we, we, don't, we, we don't try to solve the problem with uh, content or we don't try to solve the problem with creativity. We solve it with, oh, I've got a budget. I'm going to throw at it some money and hopefully it'll go away. Uh, but at, in the charity sector, what I've learned is that when you have no money, all you've got is your story and all you've got your content and you've got to make that work. So... Why, you know, when we all have that in our brands, in our, in our personal stories, why not bring the best out of that um, and use creativity and use um, uh, storytelling to, to, to make your marketing work instead of, you know, just chucking money at it? Yeah, totally. I think that's the key, isn't it? You've got to have a strategy. You've got to know what you're trying to get your prospects or customers to do and why they care and why they need you. So I think there's so, you know, there's a huge upfront strategic piece that sometimes people forget to, you know, map back to or even do sometimes, which is super important. So you've had this amazing career. You've worked mainly, I guess, over the past few years in developing pretty epic social media strategies for some pretty epic brands. And now you run your own business. So tell me a little bit about that. So cliche. Started off in the pandemic. Um, and uh, I've always been thinking about doing my own, uh, you know, uh, my own business. Um, and uh, when, yeah, during the pandemic, I thought that's now's the time. Um, and when I first started, it was uh, it was like I, I would do digital anything. So I did copywriting. I did uh, social media stuff. Um, and at some point, I just thought I should probably grow up as a business person. So um, I started looking at, at, to see what opportunities there are out there that no one's really touched. And I, I'm looking at LinkedIn and I think everybody's going on it. Like in the last five years, the user base has nearly doubled, right? I've looked at stats where uh, almost half of uh, social traffic that goes to B2B sites come from LinkedIn. So this thing is a beast. And yet when we look at company pages, we see a lot of you know, big followings. Um, 100,000, million I've seen, 3 million I've seen. And then you look at the engagement on the content, it's like, whoa, it's not the same, is it? Why is there only like 17 likes and like 60% of that is from their own staff members? Their content's not reaching their audience. So that's a, that's a huge miss. Um, and I feel like, you know, if any company that kind of wakes up to this right now and takes advantage of this, you don't have to be great. You just have to be good. And you just have to recognize the the opportunity, and it's like it's like a wide open net. Just tap the ball in, right? So, first person that gets there wins. Yeah, so true. Though you're you're right. I think there's a big opportunity in the well in the world of digital for all of us because that's where that's where we all live and breathe. When I say digital, I mean social channels, specifically LinkedIn. I think. The podcast I recorded live last week with Grace Andrews from the Diary of a CEO and uh, the fantastic Andy Lambert, ex-content um, cow now, Adobe, were kind of delving into some of the stats that in terms of like how people now search for B2B suppliers using those social media platforms, LinkedIn, something like 70% of the research is done on LinkedIn. So if you're not on LinkedIn and pushing out thought leadership and driving your, you know, I guess your influence to your prospects and helping them solve the problems that they have using social channels. To me, your business isn't going to last that long because that's where the research is happening. You look at the stats from, and again, I've spoken this on about this on the podcast before, but you look at the younger generation, you know, Gen Z, for instance, they do not use Google. They do not use to, to search for stuff. They use TikTok. TikTok is their search platform. You know, we're inherently, you know, news articles are on, you know, X or Twitter, whatever we want to call it. So the way that we search and do our research is changing. I'm the same. All of my shopping, I do on Instagram. That's where I find the brands. I don't go onto Google and search for brands. I explore and I find brands that I want to buy you know, usually clothes or jewelry or shoes or whatever it might be 
I find them through so my social channels. So think about your own behavior because what you do probably is what other people are doing. And, you know, not saying don't spend on, you know, PPC anymore, but I mean, I definitely would be spending less on PPC and spending more on developing really good social media strategies. So I hope that's going to be something that we can dig more into today. Yeah. I think, you know, first, uh, Twitter forever. I, will, I can never call it X. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Twitter forever. <laughs> uh, second, I think you're, you're 100% right. And I think uh, to add to that, I think what's fascinating is that LinkedIn has been around since since I was doing print, right? And uh, and it's still here. And it's, it's I don't know if it's made a comeback or it just did a glow up. But ultimately, it's 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 here and it's, it's more uh, relevant than ever. And my bet is that it's going to be the same for the next 30 years because everybody wants to be the next TikTok. Everybody wants to be the next. They were, and before that, they wanted to be the next Instagram. And before that, they wanted to be the next Facebook. But no one wants to be the next LinkedIn. Nobody wants to go to that place and go against Microsoft money. So I think that I think it's a, a, a platform well worth investing in. Yeah, I mean, it's changed so much. It used to just be your online CV, right? But now it's a publishing platform in its own right. It's a research platform. I find so much from a you know B2B perspective, researching other businesses, what they're doing, what's going on, the insights that I can get from that platform and how it helps empower my outreach from a sales perspective as well. It's you know, it wins, it totally wins in terms of everything that I, I need social platforms to do. So it's a very exciting space. And yeah, big LinkedIn advocate. So before we dig into LinkedIn, which I feel like we kind of should do, but there's other things I want to <laughs> ask you. Um, you have obviously done some pretty awesome work for some pretty big brands. Do you want to tell me a little bit about well, should we start with Just Eat? Because I know that was a huge one. And then let's move on to Pret and what I guess B2B brands can learn from that. So tell me about the work you were doing for Just Eat and some of the amazing campaigns and the deliverables that you you managed to achieve for wow, them. Just Eat was just so much fun. I felt like I was cheating. I was like, I won. This is great. I'm having fun and they're paying me for it. So, <laughs> And I had this wonderful team. Uh, shout out to my team. Um, you know who you are. Um, and uh, and it was this incredible brand who built itself on less about food and more about humor. Um, and when I was working there, there were it was a real challenger kind of mentality. So the challenge uh, from the CMO to us was uh, do content without using photos of food. Like don't the worst was the cheese pool. Like no, like everyone does the cheese pool for pizza. Don't do that. So what we ended up doing was creating a character. What would just eat be uh, responding to? What, are, what does it like? What does it don't like? What does it hate? And how would they react to that? Um, and that's the behavior that we replicated on our social media channels, particularly LinkedIn at the time. LinkedIn. Oh gosh, I got LinkedIn in the brain. Particularly Twitter at the time uh, when there was a lot of live events and, and uh, uh, third, uh, third screen uh, you know, platform viewing. And um, we used Twitter for that. And uh, we would, you know, uh, go on shows, uh, tweet out both shows like um, Your Vision, um, which, which we had like a we had a table. We brought takeaway. There was like six of us in marketing, another six from customer service. And we're live tweeting the event. It was so much fun. Um, and from there, I feel like I, what I've learned from, from Just Eat was... Um, the importance of having a character behind your brand because you can say all these things about your values and all this stuff, but if it's not proven in action or if it's not proven in in your content, um, then then it doesn't exist. It's just it's just words, right? So uh, that was that was a big lesson for me. Uh, then I moved on to Pret, which was a very different lesson and a very different brand because when I was at Just Eat, it was about um, this brand that and its behavior and how it would react to real life events. And in Pret, they were like, no, we don't want any of that. I was like, what, why did you hire me? <laughs> and it was, at Pret, it was about their own story because they have such a rich story to tell. Um, and they have so, they have like, they're built on values, right? They're built, you know, they're, they're, they have a, a um, charity arm that was organically uh, uh, grown. Um, and, uh, they, everything they do has a purpose behind it. And so that was far more important and valuable to tell than like, let's hijack, I don't know, talk like a pirate day. That was not important. More importantly, 
you know, talk about the ingredients on the sandwiches, talk about where we find find the ingredients. Um, the 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 peak for me was when I was I was lucky enough to be there when um, they launched uh, Veggie Prep, and um, which you know if if you guys don't know, it was uh, before vegan foods were as popular, and um, and Pret was one of the first brands to kind of take it over the edge, and uh, they did we we did I'm gonna put we we did a pop up, um, and uh, and it was incredible. Um, there was, you know, no advertising, classic advertising, um, and uh, there was social media, there was PR, there was word of mouth. Um, the the CEO did blogs. So that was the 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 main kind of communication between the brand and customers about the the evolution of getting to this this point, and and what it resulted was this pop up moment that um, caused us to run out of food on the second day. It was so mad. Um, and, and all, all of that, it's because of telling our story and telling it well and finding an audience that, that, um, that really appreciates it and creating a, a, a genuine relationship between, between the, um, the audience and the brand to the point where we encouraged people to tweet about it in, in shop and the tweets that they, 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 they send us any like tweaks they want to see in food, they, it could end up being a tweak in the food itself. So imagine writing to a brand and then eating it at some point. That's the relationship we were building. That was really cool. Wow. I mean, it's not just user-generated content. That's user-generated product. And what better, well, there is no better way to run a business. Like understanding that you're, you know, developing something that your audience want, in this case, you know, being ahead of the game with vegan vegetarianism and, you know, a huge not just trend, but societal, cultural change that we know the whole world needs to sit behind. I'm not fully veggie, but I'm pescatarian. Um, so, you know, I totally sit behind all of that and I understand, you know, the changes that things like that can make and it's really important to me. So, you know, you're also dying, die, dying? You're <laughs> also dialing into, yeah, dying. Uh, you're also dialing into things that people feel really emotional and care about and giving them the ability to get involved in creating a business and a company. So it's not even, it is marketing, but it's not even just marketing. This is kind of, you know, your customers helping develop your business, which I think if more brands can do that and really, you know, make people feel like they're important, that they have a voice and that you're listening to them and making changes to your business that, you know, are going to help them achieve what they want to achieve or you know do something that's important to them whatever type of business you are there's a huge amount you can learn from that yeah i mean how many times have we sat around a table or, or you know companies have sat around a table a board meeting and, and said oh we need to give you know make make the people feel like they're a part of their brand or give them ownership literally give them ownership i think that it's uh you know when we give give that concept lip service it's never going to go anywhere um, but that was that was an incredible moment to to be a part of uh, just and it really drove that home for me. Yeah, I think there's you know the more you can do. I mean, we do that. We are, I always ask my audience, you know, what platforms do you want us to engage with you on? If we're going to create a community platform, and in fact, guys, I'm going to ask you about this. Um, yeah, if we were going to create a community platform, where should we create it? Should it live on LinkedIn? Should it live on you know a community platform like Guild? Should it be on WhatsApp? Should it be on Slack? I want to be in the place where my audience, you know, find it easier to connect with me and can get the information that they want. So, you know, we ask our we ask our listeners and you know our podcast guests and the people that attend our events what they want so that we can show up in the right place at the right time in a way that's convenient for them. And I think sometimes businesses, brands, whatever you want to say, forget to do that. Business leaders and they have this idea and they think it's a great one, but they haven't actually spoken to their audience or made their audience feel involved. And if you can do that, if you can make that flip change, it, you will reap huge rewards. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, speaking about like, you know, online kind of platforms to, to build community, uh, I was just at an event where they uh, and the organizer actually did a post on LinkedIn saying that um, the community that was very involved on, on Twitter, they're seeing more on LinkedIn now. And I think that's fascinating that, you know, when, uh, uh, you know, just the SEO community who's so heavily involved in Twitter is now moving into LinkedIn. So, you know, if they're moving, you know, what's going on, right? Yeah. So just like me, 
You are a big LinkedIn fan, right? We've talked about this a lot. I wasn't before. You if weren't. You talk, if you talked to then. me like three years ago, four years ago, it was practically my personality to go, oh, who uses LinkedIn anyways, right? It's just like, I just didn't get it. Um, and then and then I started creating content and I started kind of attracting more like-minded people. And and then all of a sudden that kind of like, I think what happens is when, when you first get on the LinkedIn, you don't actually follow people you want to follow. And so you end up with these like kind of you know viral posts that some, sometimes a little toxic, sometimes a little bit like hustle culture, and you're like, mm, this is not for me. But once you start building your own network of people you actually want to interact with, your feed starts changing. And it becomes not only uh, nourishing, but also these relationships you can build are so incredible. Uh, so that's changed it for me, is, is that kind of gradual change from, you know, not having people that are active and um, uh, people I want to follow. And then all of a sudden, I'm seeing more and more of what I, I appreciate. Uh, and I'm learning from the platform just by showing up. I also see people kind of showing up when um, they're like, oh, out of office. And then I know they're liking my content. So are they using it as an entertainment uh, platform? It's like, I'm kind of out of work, but also this is my break. This is my way of taking a break. So that's interesting to see. But Yeah, it's changed. It's kind of like the platform that you, the social platform that you don't use when you go on holiday. But now you do. Yeah. I mean, I do. I mean, I just don't ever turn off from work. But, you know, I will... I would find it really hard not to post and not to engage and visit LinkedIn while I'm on holiday. In the same way that I go on Instagram, I go on LinkedIn now because work is a huge part of my life. I mean, I run my own business. I feel that I have to need to show up on the platforms in order to, you know, keep business alive, but also to keep my mind alive because I actually enjoy consuming the content. I enjoy driving engagement and learning from my audience and learning from the people that I follow. So I think it's, it is, you know, you have to consistently keep an eye on the platforms. They're changing all the time. I think LinkedIn have literally launched this week, maybe brand partnerships, which is again, something, you know, new that's come out. You know, Instagram also this week have launched broadcast channels. I don't know when this is coming out, so apologies, guys, if this is a few weeks later, but as it stands today, which is the 20th of September, that's, that's, where we are, you know, the, their platforms are constantly re releasing new things and the platforms want you to engage with, well, if they see you engage with the new things they're launching, they're more likely to like you and prioritise your content and give it the, you know, air, space and time that you want to have for your own content. So it's definitely worth engaging with the new things that the platforms are, are using because then your content and yeah, your profile will get, you know, highlighted a lot more by the platform itself. So I think it's super important to keep an eye on trends, but are there any specific things? Let's really talk tactically here, Anthony. Are there any specific things that you're seeing happening on LinkedIn? Um, I guess that you've you've learned from your career, but you're implementing at the moment for your clients that are working really, really hard. I think the the the, the first lesson for everybody is to to understand that they probably have a lot of great content already, right? Um, a lot of brands I work with aren't actually short on content. They're not short on knowledge. It's they're short on the the ability to kind of take that long form knowledge and content and break it down into something that's enjoyable to to consume in short form. So then, you know, I, what, the example I give is sometimes, you know, if you have a blog that's like 1,700 words, on average, that's about seven minutes and 30 seconds to read. And on LinkedIn, the average time to to spend on that platform is only seven minutes and 38 seconds, right? So like you're, you're asking them to read a blog that takes all the time that they are willing to spend on the platform, of course, they're not gonna they're gonna uh, engage with that. So you know, take take your long form content, break that down, break it down into a way that's digestible and enjoyable to 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 consume, so that uh, so that they will actually do it. Because don't expect your audience to kind of get everything that you want them to get in that that blog post in one shot. They, they don't have the time. That's not that's not the name of the game on LinkedIn. But break it up so that they, they see little bits every single time they sh they uh, they show up in the platform. And if they're engaged with the whole thing, they've read the whole thing, right? So I can't remember what the original question no, was. No, that's yeah. good. But so yeah, so shattering <laughs> content. I think that's super important. What are your views on? So this is very front of mind for me because yeah, for, for one of our amazing clients, we've uh, in fact I've just gone through it with our head of strategy, been working on 
a proposal to do a white paper and we really want to push them to create a lot more content off the white paper, which of course they're going to need to have budget to do, but we're going to be profiling some pretty heavy lifting people in the world of e-commerce, some amazing thought leaders um, in that space around the kind of psychologies of marketing and the psychology of e-commerce in specific. But we think as much as it's great to have an awesome white paper, which, you know, again, might be 5,000 words, it's going to take a bit of time for people to digest it, although we're going to make it really beautiful and infographic led, you know, we really want to do some, you know, little vox pops and lots of content that we can shatter out of that. So because I think that often will get more attention than, mm -hmm. you know, than the the um, white paper itself. Same with Same with this podcast, you know, we get so much more reach no offense to those of you listening on spotify and please or apple Podcasts, or wherever you like to listen or watch on youtube but you know, we don't get thousands and hundreds of thousands of listens on spotify and apple podcasts and watches on youtube what we do get is hundreds of thousands of engagements and watches of our social posts yep. if i didn't do the social posts i would have a much smaller engaged audience than I do by developing the social posts. So what's your view on those kind of bigger PCO? You know, you've talked about blogs and articles, but what do you think the value in today's world of you know, that longer form content like white papers is? I think that, I think it's still relevant because I think it's it's almost like writing an essay, isn't it? It's like, what are my thoughts? What's my perspective on this this subject that I'm trying to, to, um, to have some influence over? And if you're not writing in long form, sometimes you, you, you don't actually know your full argument, right? So yeah, classic essay, isn't it? It's like, you know, you do your intros and it's three points of like um, three argument points and you, ra you, you wrap up at the end. That's kind of like a white paper in a way, right? Um, but then, but then the, 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 uh, the hard part is to actually break those up into individual stories because each of those three argument points actually it's its own story. And within that, it's it's little short stories that you can tell on social media to bring people into the long form. So I think that there's still a lot of relevancy. I think that there's uh, still run those campaigns about you know uh, you know gatekeep it and get the get that data, uh, which is very important for marketing. But also at the same time, don't neglect your social media channels. Don't neglect it by simply accidentally hiding it all in, in long form content just because just because your 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 KPIs are downloads or your KPIs are leads. Um, and I think that's probably one of the reasons why companies don't use LinkedIn that much is because our our kind of measurement system is a bit behind. We're always trying to go for, you know, the, uh, marketing teams are uh, measured against like leads and downloads. Great. But also that's not how LinkedIn is going to win. And those, those stats completely go against the strengths of LinkedIn. So I think we need to shift that focus so that we're able to let our social media teams breathe uh, and let them do their best work. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, uh, white papers still do them, but also invest, put investment after, after that content is done as well so that you're breaking that up into what you call shatter content. I love that, by the way. I'm going to steal that. Um, and, uh, and, and really... Have those mo have those moments in um, in social media. I mean, it's like movies, right? Imagine like doing a movie and doing zero promotion for it. Yeah. Imagine Spider Man into Spider Verse and no one's done a, a trailer for it. Yeah, right. Like, why would I watch this thing? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You're expecting people to come up, and that's a really good way of looking at it. It is. Think of your social content as like your trailer for your bigger, maybe more authoritative piece of content. Be it a white paper. Be it a one hour long podcast, whatever it might be, the longer form content, I think you have to seed the short form content in order to capture the attention and just, you know, just been my own ideas on this. Um, and Ansi, I definitely want to hear yours as well. You know, the kind of things that you can do that we see great success with are, you know, some... I don't know, slide share on LinkedIn, these work really, really well because every single click um, as you're kind of swiping through is an interaction. Every single interaction, LinkedIn prioritizes your content because you're getting more interactions on your content. So a slide share picking out five things or 10 things, maybe, ten, you know, the more the better. I think you can do up to 12, maybe even more nowadays. Um, but you can put a, you know, slide share together, which has got the key salient points, want to learn more, 
go and delve into the white paper. Here's the download link. Or a little video snippet of one of the contributors talking about what they're talking about in more detail in the article. Create that as a little video. Or develop a little quote or a testimonial. You know, want to know how such and such achieved da 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 go and read it. So there's lots of different types of content that you can create. For me, I would say those slide shares sometimes even, you know, perform or outperform video content, but video and slide shares would 100% be my kind of go-to because that's going to drive the leads and the opportunities to, you can't just create a white paper and hope people are going to come and find it, right? Agreed, agreed. I think that it also depends on the story. I think that's why I love LinkedIn so much is I call it the last great social media platform because we're not cornered into like Instagram was like, oh, you've, when it started, especially, you've got to do one by one images. And it's like, oh, but what if I don't want to do that, right? And then now TikTok, it's like, you've got to do this like, you know, long uh, video. And it's like, um, what if I don't want to dance? So on LinkedIn, it's, it, it's uh, you're able to pick and choose the right medium to tell your story the best. Um, and I think that's great. And so to your point, you know, carousels are great or, or the slide shares are great. Videos are great. But sometimes you can even do a single image. And if that image is powerful enough to drive home the, 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 uh, the concept of the story of, of, of your, of your uh, caption, you can do that as well. So it very much depends on your story. But I do agree that those are my two kind of go to like, I will try those two first. Like yeah. Anything else. But you can do so much. Like you say, there's so many different content types available on LinkedIn, which I, which does, sorry, we're going a bit LinkedIn crazy today. Um, but it does give the platform real differentiation, I think, across all the social platforms. And you know, yes, it will work for B2B, maybe slightly better than B2C. But again, you know, just because you're a business trying to talk to a consumer doesn't mean that you shouldn't be present on LinkedIn because the likelihood is that all your consumers are probably going to be on LinkedIn as well as TikTok and Instagram and X, Twitter, <laughs> wherever else they might be. So, you know, that you can do polls, you can contribute to articles, you can, you know, you contribute to articles that LinkedIn have created and then they give you a contributor badge, you know, which highlights you as a thought leader in that sector. So it's great for building your own, you know, your own personal brand. You can, you know, like I say, put polls out, you can post videos, you can actually you know stream live events and let your audience know you can develop newsletters on linkedin that will then land in everyone who um follows or you know is a connection of yours on linkedin in their email inbox every whatever day you set it to do it like there's so much that you can do it's one of i think the most immense publishing platforms that's out there and i think any b2b brand that is not prioritizing LinkedIn as a channel is going to struggle. I can say personally, my own experience, when we started Street, email is still, you know, I guess the main business critical channel that all we know people are going to have to utilize. And I'm not saying don't take a multi-channel approach and use email and Instagram and various other platforms. But we now get so much more from LinkedIn as a channel than we ever got from email if we can still continue to do the stuff we do brilliantly on email as well, that's just a whole load more leads and opportunities that I've gained by taking a proper, you know, consistent, considered approach to treating LinkedIn as a go-to-market strategy and channel for my business. Yeah, and this is a channel that your competitors are sleeping on, so get to it, right? Yeah, yeah. Why? Why are they sleeping <laughs> on it? It's crazy. It is nuts. It is nuts. Um, but I, I think there's a stigma that, that carried, again, this thing's been around for, what, 20, 30 years, that stigma is hard to shake. You know, when something used to be uncool and all of a sudden they're cool, you're like, mm, are you sure? Like, <laughs> and I think that it, it takes a personal experience to change your perspective on LinkedIn. It takes you kind of loving LinkedIn before you go, well, hold on a second. If this is working for me, what about the company I work for, right? What about the clients I work with? Um, and until you get your own aha moment, I think it's hard to, it's just stats on paper. Right. And um, it's hard to connect with that. So um, I don't know. Connect with me and Katie. See how you see how your feed improves. Yeah, definitely. I think that's the thing is you need to you've just got to get started. But how do you get started? So that's a question that I'm going to put to you next, Anthony, is if you've if you've you know dabbled in this, but you've not really got started, what 
what should people do? What are the first, apart from obviously talk to someone like us, but apart from that, what would be the first steps that they should or could take to developing a strategy for LinkedIn? Ooh, loaded question. So I think there's two parts to this. One, if, well, first, let's look at the company and look at you know the opportunities there because if you have a decent amount of following, just even a thousand, just start with that. That imagine talking to a thousand people. Would you would you give up on an opportunity? Probably not, right? So let's get to it. Um, and I think that uh, a lot of people worry about what they put on LinkedIn. Um, if it's going to be cringy or if it's good enough or what do I put out there? A lot of times companies, because of this kind of conundrum, they kind of just give it to the HR department and go, you just post pictures of our picture, pizza party, right? And then that gets engagement, but it doesn't actually talk about the value of your, of your company as much. So I think the first thing I, I think I can think of is look at your long form content. All the white papers you've got, SEO content is great. If, if your content is performing well in SEO, that means it's, that has value. So start with those pieces of content and break that down into small pieces of content for LinkedIn, right? Um, you know, do do research on, on how to properly tell these stories, right? Don't just chuck a link onto your blog. That's not going to work. No one's gonna no one's gonna read that thing just because you said you wrote it. Um, so I think that that's the first thing that uh, companies as a company can do is look at their long form content and, and go, what has been giving value and how can we give that same value on LinkedIn. Great, easy hack because you've already got a, a mountain, a gold mine of content that you're ready to, to get into. Then the second thing I would look into is also, I think you were um, talking about this, in, is personal branding. You, know, you look at the different um, uh, people that work for your, your company. It's like, whoa, all of these people can become influencers for my brand, right? How do I encourage these people to share about their, their experiences working here? What are the values I want um, my my uh, staff to amplify about our company, um, and maybe we we do a talk about that. You know, get the company involved and let them know what the the story is behind your brand, so that they are understanding what stories they should be sharing. And I think that that's going to be helpful as well to to expand your your reach as as a brand. I love that. And the, the first one, well, I love both of the points, but the first one especially, I think, like you say, people create such great content. Even if it is old, it doesn't necessarily matter. There'll be some really salient, helpful value exchange points within that content that you'll be able to create content for your social channels and, like you say, especially LinkedIn. So, yeah, go back and look what you've got in your arsenal. Just because it was done a year ago, six months ago, doesn't necessarily mean that, it's not valuable to your audience anymore. No, I'm going to bring that into bring bring that print into this conversation because what made them great 30 years ago is still what makes them great now. That sandwich, what what makes it great now is what made it made it great then. It's the same for your your own uh, your company content. It's evergreen, right? You started a business for a reason. That reason has not changed. That 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 uh, passion has not changed. And so what I help you know my clients with is kind of find that. And then, and then always bring that long, that short form content stemming from those, yeah. right? And I think once you're able to do that, you're going to see so much more content coming up from, from your LinkedIn. Yeah. Well, you'll get more reach. You will build an audience that you haven't been talking to. And that, I guess, is, you know, what this all boils down to. It's about driving interactions with people that value what you do, what you talk about, and how you can potentially help them. And that is what is going to help your business grow. Absolutely. Um, Anthony, before I let you go, um, I have one last question for you. Now, I used to always ask my guests a lovely little surprise question at the end. If you haven't listened to the podcast, you won't know. Um, but which was, who would you recommend to come on the podcast? Now, I'm actually changing up that question. I've literally just decided. I'm going to ask you for a recommendation. Now, this could be someone that you think would be great for me to interview on the podcast. This could be a book that you think would be great for myself and our lovely listeners to read it could be another podcast for us to go and listen to or it could be I don't know someone to go and follow on social media that gives loads of really great insights so is there anyone or anything that you would like to recommend to me and our lovely listeners well I've got a friend who's uh who's a visual uh storyteller her name's Natalia um and she's she's been my hero from day one um when i was working at the brands she's already started her own company 
uh, as an illustrator, and she would uh, she's built her, her whole business on um, uh, working with big like B two B brands, um, and she would go into conferences and live scribe their their events. And it's just I just love watching her brain work. She is just a, you know just an absolute spark. So I think she'd be great on any podcast. So if she, if she comes to this one, that'd be amazing. Um, Could she live transcribe the podcast as she's being interviewed on it? Can you imagine? I mean, how cool would that be? Can you imagine? That that I mean, I'm, I'm putting it out there. That's going to be your highest viewed. Uh, view, Love <laughs> viewed that. Podcast. And what's her full name so people can go find her on LinkedIn? Well, her her company's name is Nataka Design. Yeah. Um, I'll put it under yeah, here somewhere. Send, yeah. yeah, send it to me, and I'll make sure it's in the show notes. Yeah, but uh, Natalia is just you know someone I've been looking up to uh, since day one. Um, she's been a real inspiration to start my own business um and yeah just her her brain is something else i think that uh uh, i i think it'd be incredible to be able to kind of bottle it into a podcast yeah love that anyone who can live transcribe something your brain's got to work pretty quick to be creative off the back of what you're hearing in such a short space of time so i literally love those guys i think it's amazing yeah brilliant It's, it's like a harry mac you ever seen him no uh, he's like a, a freelance rap and freelance freestyle rapper. Um, and he's just like pandemic. He built his own name, uh, over like doing videos cause he can't go out there doing street stuff anymore. So he was doing, um, Omegle raps and, uh, uh, just built his name from there. And he's like, yeah, it's just massive freestyle rapper. His brain just goes. Oh my God. So, yeah, you gotta look him up. Yes. There we go. There's another one. <laughs> Two links in the show notes for you guys that I promise will be there um Anthony thank you so much for joining me today it's been great to well chat with you and learn so much and really kind of think and focus in on the importance of well all kind of contents but especially LinkedIn so thank you for joining oh thanks for having me